Amen. I know I am. <laughs> How many of you are warm and toasty? <laughs> no. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> well, you would have had to be here at a time when we ran the other air conditioners nonstop, and you still sweated like crazy. <laughs> Because it could never get it cool. But uh, thank God for small wonders. Amen. All right, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and start. So let's all stand and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. And uh, just believe more will be coming in as we, as we move forward. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we're really blessed because there, uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of churches who don't have service anymore on Wednesdays. Ooh, come on. Uh, they, they gave up Sunday night and they gave up Wednesday night. Uh, I guess we're just some of the old diehards. <laughs> we're, we're not going to give it up. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, God, for the blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you, Lord, for your many, 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 many blessings. And, Lord, we literally, Lord, as the old hymn says, count your blessings one by one. Lord, uh, it'd take too long uh, because you just bless us so much. So, Lord, we ask tonight, God, that you would be with us, others that are on their way, uh, traveling mercies for them, Father, those that are watching online. Father, we pray, God, that they'll receive a blessing tonight as well. So, Lord, we surrender this service to you because tonight, God, we want to learn more about hearing your voice and, Lord, following what we hear uh, from the Word of God. So, Lord, we surrender this service to you. Lord, may you be glorified, may you be edified, may you be lifted up. And we're going to give you all the praise and honor in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Before we go into praise and worship, I want to make uh, an announcement. Uh, I'm going to be contacting all the leadership in the church uh, on a one-on-one basis. And we're going to be getting with you. And talking to you about what your plans are for next year. Uh, As we get ready to make a few shifts and changes. Um, Wendy, uh, everybody sit down just for a minute. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have did that. I got ahead of myself. Wendy had a a word the other night, and it really made me think about something. Nancy and I have been talking about this for quite a while. Wendy, you saw us as a car wash, all right? So I don't know if that meant we were all dirty or what. (laughs) But uh, one lane was open, but we had everything and all the abilities to open up many lanes. So I believe what God is getting ready to do is, I know you look around at the numbers tonight, we may go like, are you kidding me? (laughs) But God's in control. That's one thing you learn. God's always in control, and I believe what God is doing is helping us get in our lanes. So uh, we'll be contacting each uh, leadership individually, getting with you, talking, sharing, and uh, just really see where your heart is for the next year, uh, because I think we've come to a point now to where uh, we, got, we're, we need to be committed to what God is calling us to do, uh, and uh, we're excited about what God is in the process of doing. And uh, so um, when you get a phone call from me, uh, it's nothing bad. It's just that, uh, you know, uh, we want to get together and talk. <laughs> All right? Does that sound good? Amen. Now everybody can stand. <laughs> and let's worship the Lord tonight. <clears throat> Amen.
keep on getting better. Keep on getting better. Keep on. you give us, Father. Father, and we want to stand in your love and be in your presence each and every day.
telling you what's God speaking to your heart right now he speaks to us constantly most of the time we fail to listen but what is he saying to you right now what is he speaking to you right this moment What's he saying to you right now? You got a microphone? Oh, I got one right here. Jeff, you hand that mic. Thank you, sir. I heard him say intimacy, and then he slowed it down. He said, into me, see. Look into me. Both ways and to let him in and see. Amen. 
intimacy. Intimacy. Amen. Rick, what's the Lord saying to you right now? I'm going to reserve you for when I preach here in a minute. Okay. I know the Lord is speaking. Danny, what's the Lord saying to you right now? What's He saying to you? God speaks to us all the time. We just we don't listen. We're, we're so busy, even in church. And I'm as guilty as as anybody, probably even more so, because it seems like we come. We've got this thing in our mind. We've got to get A, B, C, and D done before we go home. And sometimes, Ben, we just don't stop. And God's speaking. And sometimes I think He's screaming at us. And we're just we got to get it done. You know. And we just move right on. <clears throat> and we don't stop long enough to really hear what God is saying to us. God does hear us. The song we sang right before the Yeshua, I want to know you. I want to know you, Lord. I believe that song fit everybody in this room. We were told we weren't good enough. We didn't measure up enough. Uh, and all kinds of things. But aren't you glad? His blood was more than enough. <laughs> and His blood covered everything. And we have eternal salvation. Give the Lord a praise offering. Now, I know the young teenagers and our young children may not agree with me right now, but if I went home right now, I feel like I've never been in church. <laughs> it's with the presence of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, praise team. Thank you for just being led by the Holy Spirit. Really, I really appreciate that more than you'll, well, not more than you know, but more than many people know. Amen. Oh, I'm kidding. Amen. All right, we're going to let our youth and our children be dismissed at this time. And uh, God's been good. Wow, what a pr- sweet presence of the Lord today. Wow. I don't know why I got this for. Ah. Okay. Ah. How many of you agree God is good? Yeah. Ah. Tonight we're going to share some things, and I believe it'll bless you. Have you ever been uh, running, uh, I guess the old saying is uh, 40 to nothing or something, and it seems like you've been doing it for years, and all of a sudden your body one day wakes up and says, stop, <laughs> enough, and well, today my body said, stop, <laughs> enough, uh, it seemed like all of a sudden all the, all the years just kind of caught up to me, <laughs> I just got so... I got so tired today, and this is not my norm. I took a nap, <laughs> and that's not me, all right, at all. Uh, but, boy, my body just said, "Woo, slow it down, buddy. And um, But anyhow, God's been so good to us, and I'm glad you're here tonight to worship the Lord. I tell you, I just can't get over praise and worship. It was just so intimate. It was just beautiful. It was just uh, incredible, incredible. We're so blessed with our praise and worship team. Uh, I was looking tonight in the direction that I want to go in, 
Because we've been talking about a lot about hearing God's voice. And I remember several years ago, you know, Nancy and I was married by um, a judge. And um, we sat in traffic court for about three hours as he went through all the cases. And then when he was through, he called us back to the chamber. <clears throat> Magistrate John Hughes. Fifty-five years later, I've never forgot his name. <laughs> and uh, so we went in the back uh, chambers, and, uh, and he married us. And uh, I don't even know why I started telling you that story for. <laughs> I told you it's been a long day. But uh, anyhow, when we, when we made our commitment one to another, we knew that it was a, a lifetime commitment. Now, I don't know exactly what happened, but I do remember this. I remember when I first met Nancy, I remember there was just some voice on the inside of me that told me that she would be my wife for life. I mean, it was just there. Uh, Can I tell you that was the voice of God? Well, after all these years, I believe it was, okay, because it's proven to be true. Um, But it was just something. God speaks to us so oftentimes, and we just don't pause long enough to listen to him. Because we didn't have um, a regular wedding, we went to Bible college in one year. I know I think it was our second term of Bible college in, in Tennessee. Uh, they were having a class on business. And in the business class, they were teaching young ministers all the protocol for funerals and weddings and, you know, dedications and uh, just all business that's done in church. So they wanted to do a wedding. And uh, so they asked Nancy and I, would we like to get married again? (laughs) All right. And I thought, well, you know, this is better than a judge's chambers anyhow. And so so they laid out a wedding for us. And uh, we, you know, went down the aisle and they did the whole nine yards. So we felt like, well, at least we had some kind of a church wedding. All right. (laughs) Kind of a semblance of one. But the um, but the man who uh, he's gone on now with the Lord. But the one who did the ceremony, his name was Frank Penninger. He was from uh, Arkansas. And he was sharing his testimony with us. And I've never forgot his testimony. Now, this has been a long time. but never forgot it. He said he was out and he was cutting wood. And he was out, you know, in the jungle area. Well, not jungle, but in the forest area. And he was cutting wood. And he said he had an axe and it slipped. And he almost cut his leg off down by the calf. And he said, I laid there and I was bleeding to death. He said, I didn't know God. He said, but I knew that I needed a relationship with Jesus before I died. And he said, I remember the words that my mother had spoken to me about receiving Jesus and asking him into my heart. And he said, I laid there and I was bleeding And I knew that my life was was gone. And he said, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. He said, I did not have an earth-shaking experience. It wasn't like the heavens opened up and there was thunder. Uh, I stood on the Word of God. That if I confess my sins with my mouth and believed in my heart that Jesus was the Lord... I would be saved. Well, somebody came by and found him before he passed away or bled to death. And uh, he lived to tell the story and to do our wedding. Sometimes God speaks to us in ways that we don't really, we're not familiar with. For Frank, God spoke to him, and even though it wasn't this earth-shattering uh, experience, it was a simple speaking to him, Frank, if you'll say the words that your mother told you to say from the Word of God, you have the assurance that you'll be saved. How many times has God spoken to you 
How many times has God given you a direction through his audible voice? Now, you know how I feel about hearing from God. I take it extremely serious, all right, because we've made such a habit of our cliches, and we take away from the power of God's Word when it speaks to us. So tonight, I want you and I to realize God does speak. So, Jeff, I said I was going to save you for later. All right, well, later's now. All right. Can you give us an experience to where God spoke to you and directed you into a certain path, a certain calling, uh, a certain direction? You received something that you needed from God, and he spoke to you. Okay. You knew. Okay. That's good. God speaks to us all the time. And he leads us and drives. I'm going to share. I shared this with a couple of the men in the prayer, and it's a little bit long. But here's the one thing I want us to understand. God, every day, wants to direct your life. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. And he wants you doing what he's called you to do. And many times we're waiting for people to tell us what it is that God wants us to do. Did you just hear what I said? We're waiting for people to tell us what God wants us to do instead of hearing the voice of God. Now, if we're always waiting, now listen, you know when I'm sharing these things, I'm very open about things and I'm very honest, all right? If we're always waiting for somebody to tell us what we're supposed to be doing for God, many times we're going to miss what God really has for us to do. All right? Why? Because I only see the outward person. God sees the heart of each and every one of us that's in this room tonight. So God knows what he's put in your heart, and he knows what he wants you to do with that which he's put inside of you. I only see the outward person sometimes. Uh, through discernment and through revelation, God allows me as a leader to many times be able to see something that's in your heart. But a lot of times I've watched people be totally directed the wrong way. I had a young man come to me not long ago, well, before we came back here, uh, maybe a year or so. And he come to me one day and he said, Pastor Paul, he said, uh, uh, I believe I'm supposed to be a missionary. <clears throat> and I said, okay. And he said, yeah, I'm getting ready to leave my job. I'm going to sell my house and I'm going to pack up everything. And me and my family, we're going to move and we're going to move to the Philippines. Well, I said, I'm very familiar with the Philippines, so uh, tell me a little bit more. He said, I know we're supposed to go. I said, well, what if I call a friend of mine in the Philippines, who was our director at that time, and how about if we make an arrangement for you to go over there for about two or three weeks and really kind of understand where you're going, what you're getting yourself into, uh, and the customs and everything, uh, and then make your decision and pray and ask God to confirm it. Well, he went, and uh, when he got back, he called me. And he said, Pastor, thank you so much. 
because I know that my family could never, ever live in the Philippines, all right? And it was not God that was speaking to us. It was everybody else telling me. <clears throat> well, isn't it great that he found out before he sold his house and packed up his family and quit his job? Well, I got a phone call from him probably six months later, nine months later, and he said, hey, I just wanted to touch base with you. And I said, uh, where, where are you at? What are you doing now? He said, well, I'm a praise and worship leader in a church up in Spokane, Washington, and I am in the absolute perfect will of God. <laughs> Amen. That was a long way from the Philippines, I promise you. God is always speaking to us. So I shared this, and I'm going to share it again because it's an example. Then we'll get right into the scriptures. It's an example of how God leads us if we're really wanting to be led by God. Now, sometimes, Jeremy, we say we want to be led by God, but when reality sets in, we're really not sure we want to be led by God. And what I mean by that is we might be afraid of the answer that we get. I've told you many times when I first started in ministry, uh, we lived in a little uh, 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 two-bedroom. There was four flats, two and four. We lived in one downstairs and had a closet. And uh, so when I got ready to pray, I'd go in the closet and I'd close the door. And I'd just pray and I'd pray and I'd pray. And I'd pray so hard until I knew the answer was on its way. And I'd get up and I'd quit praying. And I'd go out of the closet. And I'd go back in and I'd later on I'd pray again at another time. And the, the answer was coming and I'd get up and I'd leave. Why? Because I didn't know if I wanted to hear the answer. Because <laughs> I didn't know what it might require of me. And sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we don't know what is required of us. And sometimes we're reluctant to really press through, and get the answer from God. I needed direction several years ago. So I was praying one day, and uh, I asked the Lord, what was he leading us into? And the Lord began to really, really begin to download into my, my spirit. And while I was praying, I began to write. I don't know. Now, I'm not a journaler, all right? I know Rick is. But he's backslid. He don't journal as much as he used to, all right? So, Rick, you need to start journaling more, all right? Uh, I'm not good at journaling, okay? I never have been. Uh, But, you know, know, I found out one day that's how preachers write all their books. (laughs) They break out all their journals and all their sermons. But here, the Lord began to answer my question like this. He asked me a question. And he said, what is leadership? And then he began to answer the question. Leadership is the ability to be led. It is having to be taught and having to have an open mind to be corrected. A lot of times in leadership, we think it's only our responsibility to do the correcting. But in reality, we need to learn how to be corrected. Only then have you prepared your mind and your spirit to lead others. It is not a wealth of wisdom or knowledge, rather the ability to be channeled that God's wisdom and knowledge may flow through. If you disperse your own thoughts, now this is God speaking to me, okay? If you disperse your own thoughts, ideas, and opinions, then you stop leading and you begin hurting my people. For your knowledge is finite while mine is infinite. Leaders must know the time frame in which they are called to serve Jesus, my son, knew the time in which he was called to serve, and he was the greatest of all leaders. He was able to know the very hour. If you fail to seek my understanding. Now, I never lined this up with uh, what I shared a few weeks ago about Daniel. You remember when the angel of the Lord appeared unto Daniel, and he said, Daniel, your prayer was heard. Now, he didn't say we heard it when you began to pray. We heard it when your petition, we heard it when you set yourself to understand and humbled yourself. The moment you were willing to try to understand what's going on, 
Do you know that can be the greatest prayer that you pray sometimes? Lord, what is going on in my home, in my life, in my job, in our community, in the nation? What's going on? I need to understand. <clears throat> God said, uh, the angel said, I, I heard your prayer the very moment that you set your heart to understand. If you fail to seek my understanding, you will become a leader out of season, either ahead or falling behind, running to and fro, spinning your wheels, but never accomplishing anything of great value. To know the hour that you have been called to, knowing the point of time that you are serving in, gives you a clear direction in what way you're to go. Open your eyes <clears throat> to what is going on around you, in your family, your church, your community, and nations of which I have called you to as a leader of my people. You must realize the time that I have placed you in. Distrust and leadership abounds, not only in the secular world, but even in my body. Will you be a leader that will help establish, reestablish trust and true leadership? Do not seek glory for all glory belongs to me. Now, this was about 26 years ago when God spoke this to me. But this has been a guideline for me for all of my ministry up to even to the, this moment, okay? I was young and I needed direction. I needed to hear God speak to me and say, Paul, this is what I'm telling you. This is what I'm calling you to. This is the direction that I want you to go in. Do not seek glory, for all glory belongs to me. Do not seek the praise of others, for I alone am worthy to be praised. If you will seek my face, I will give you direction. It will not always be a complete picture. For if I do that, then you will not fully place your faith in me. <clears throat> Did you hear what God told me? He said, if you want a clear picture, then you don't need faith. All right? I'm going to give you just enough to get your right foot one step forward, and the rest of it, you're going to walk it out by faith. Rather, I will always give you enough that you will not be given to discouragement, nor will you stumble not knowing what to do. First, above all, Paul, I want you to worship me. And it's also cool when God refers to you in your first name. All right. It just makes you feel kind of good. All right. Um, I want you to worship me. Place me first in your life. Seek me diligently with all your heart, and I will speak clearly unto you. You have been called into my service, and you have known it all of your life. I have had to chastise you several times, but it was to keep you from going too far away from me. Now your service will begin to come into focus. Service is what I truly mean when you are a servant. You have been called not only prophet by men of God that I have sent your way, but you know that you are to be a builder of my house. Now, this is where I got confused, okay? You ever get confused? All right. Because he told me I was not to be a builder of my house. He said not physical. Well, I didn't get that part. <laughs> All right. Uh, but you are to rebuild the broken vessels, those houses of clay that my son died for. Rebuild them. Help them to see my love for them. Don't run from them. Yes, many are wounded. And as you have seen a wounded animal trapped in a corner, how violent they can be, so are these. Do not mistake that violence you see with your eyes as a sign of them not wanting help for that or that they are some form of reprobate. Inside is a wounded person needing help. Now, what better advice can a young preacher have than God to speak to us or speak to me in that way, guiding me, leading me, and literally setting a pattern for my pastoral ministry and the ministry that God would put in my charge? See, I don't believe God wants us to go through this world, Jeremy, just hit and miss. I believe he has something for each of us, and he is directing our life, and he's speaking to us. Inside is that wounded person needing help. I will give you discernment as you have never had, but it will come only as you need it. 
Isn't that awesome? Because he didn't want me to wear a name tag. All right, I have the gift of. He said, I'll give it to you as you have need of it, lest you get haughty and puffed up. Paul, I love you, and I have called you into my service, but I know that you can sometimes cross over into the flesh. Now, isn't that the heart of a father that is willing to correct that is willing to speak openly and frankly to us through the Holy Spirit. God knows me, and He knew some of my tendencies. And He knew what I was seeking after. So He spoke to me in that manner. So I will release the gifts into your life as I see the need. Always know that I will never forsake you. I will be there when you need me. Continue in the direction you're going. Do not worry. Place your trust in me completely. You and the local church of believers will grow in grace and wisdom. Know that you will go through trials and battles, but I have given you the land where you stand and wheresoever you go. Isn't that awesome to know that God spoke and said, you're going to go through some stuff, but don't worry about it because I've given you that land and you possess that land. So be bold, basically, and be, uh, I've given you the land where you stand. Even as Israel, when you look to me, you will have victory. When you begin to lose ground, stop looking, you have stopped looking to me. Do not see this as punishment, but rather that I am regaining your attention. So I'm standing here tonight and telling you very openly that God is telling me, Paul, I'm going to regain your attention. Keep looking to me and you are and the house is going to be blessed if you keep looking to me because I needed to get your attention again. Tell my people of my great love for them and that I send my, will send my son back for them, but there is much work to be done. So be about your father's business, saith the Lord. Now that's what God spoke to me several years ago when I began to pastor River of Life Church. <clears throat> we were seeking God's goal and his direction. Didn't know what way to go. I only knew one way. I knew Church of God way. That's the only way I knew. That's how I had been raised. That's how I had been taught. All my mentors were in that organization. Uh, everyone I grew up with was in that organization. All of them, most of the young guys my age, they went out to pastor in that organization. So that's all I knew, Jeff, was that group. That's all I knew. And God was saying, that's not what I want you to do now. I don't want you to go that same direction. So I was asking God, Lord, what direction do I go? I don't know which way to go. I only know one way. And if that was the right way, then you wouldn't have led me out of that way, all right? I'd have still been there, okay? But God was leading us into another direction. So when I began to pray and seek God... That was his response to me. So God spoke to me. Now, that was a little bit lengthy. But I know that for each of you that are here tonight, God has spoken to you in some manner, in some form. God has directed you and guided your life in, in a way that he wants it to go. Our lives aren't just a bunch of circumstances thrown together. Our lives have a divine plan. Now, when Jesus... Now, tonight, when I share this with you, I want you to really grab hold of a few things of how God speaks to us. First of all, we establish the fact that the Word of God, God speaks to us through the Logos, the written Word of God. But it is the Holy Spirit that causes this Logos Word to become a rhema word, a now word that jumps and comes alive in our heart. That's what happens when you read a scripture, and John, for the very first time, you've read the scripture a thousand times, and all of a sudden, one night, you read it, and you go like, oh my God, I never saw that before. That'd be, that's a rhema word. What it is, is God is saying, this word right now that you've read so many times, this word is a now word for you right now. And he speaks that into your heart and into your spirit. And it becomes alive inside of you. Because the Word is living. It's not dead. Remember, the Word is Jesus made flesh. And Jesus is alive. He's not dead. 
So we have a living word that's in our life that changes our life. It's not just history uh, or stories. So Jesus is making an, uh, an example here. When Jesus came to the Pharisees, I want you to look in John, uh, if you would, chapter 5, verse number 39. I'll get there. Verse number 39. Powerful scripture. Let's begin in verse number 37 in context. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you. You do not. For you do not believe in him whom he sent. You search scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is these that testify about me. You understand what that, the verse is saying? He's saying, <clears throat> you, you, you open your word, you open your Bible, and I'm encouraging to read the Bible. Okay, because it is a foundation for us. But here's what you got to understand. If you don't follow him in your heart by the spirit of God, it becomes very difficult to understand what he's saying to us through the word of God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that enlightens the word of God in our life. So the Pharisees are arguing and you've got to understand the Pharisees had one basic rule of thumb. The only thing they accepted was the oral law handed down by Moses. If it wasn't what Moses received on the mountain, they wanted nothing to do with it. Okay? So dreams didn't play into it. Visions didn't play into it. Nothing played into it. It was strictly what they had received or what Moses had received. Just the oral law. That's all they had. So Jesus is talking to them, and every day in the events of their lives, he's saying, you're searching the Scriptures because you think that in them there's life. But the very life is right here in front of you, and you don't even recognize it. How many of us know friends of ours, our relatives of ours, that are students of the Word of God, uh, but yet they have no clue about who Jesus really is, and they have no relationship with Jesus Christ? But if you got into a scriptural argument with them, boy, they, could, they can really bring up the scriptures. Because they, they, they've looked and they've studied the Word. But what they've done and what so many of us do is we study the word from a point to prove what we believe. So if I want to believe something is wrong, I'm going to dig through the scriptures and I'll find a scripture that says it's wrong. If I believe it's right, I'm going to find a scripture that says it's right. Very few people, very few, and it's all, I ain't going to say it's impossible, but it's almost next to impossible. To open the Word of God and your mind and your spirit be a blank slate. Nothing's written on your heart. Nothing in there about the Word. And you open the Word and you just read it for what it says. Most of the times we're going to go like, yeah, but that ain't what I was taught. Well, I know what the Bible says, but. Well, you're in trouble already when you do that, right? We read it from our own interpretation. Well, can I ask you a question? What if your interpretation is wrong? <laughs> Can't be right. <laughs> Jeremy's is wrong, but yours is right. <laughs> and Jeremy's sitting over there, no, Skip's wrong, mine's right. <clears throat> and we all do that. <laughs> and that's what the Holy Spirit illuminates. And that's what I'm trying to get to. We understand the Word. God speaks to us through the Word. God speaks to us, as we shared Sunday, through dreams and visions. And uh, Nancy reminded me when we went home Sunday, she said, I'm glad you throw the one in there about the wife. All right, Pilate's wife. 
uh, because most of the other dreams was Joseph and Daniel and, and others. And said, well, it was nice that there was at least one woman in there that had a dream. Well, yeah, it was. And it saved Pilate's hide, I guess. So, But anyhow, when you look at what the Pharisees say, it's only the law. It's only the written word or the oral translation of it. Then you've got to deal with Acts 10 about Peter. You know the story. We've shared it while we was going through the book of Acts. He's up on the mountain. He's up on the rooftop. He has a vision. And there's this big sheet that comes down. And in that sheet is all these unclean animals. And he said, Lord, these are unclean. And God speaks back to him and says, Peter, what I sanctify, what I cleanse, don't you dare call unclean. Now, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit speaks to us through experiences in our life. I was telling Skip earlier, I mean, some of the better sermons that I've ever preached, my inspiration came from a billboard. <laughs> All right, driving down the highway, seeing a billboard, and it said something, and all of a sudden, something sparked inside of me, and I'm going like, oh my God, that's a great message, you know? And then you begin to look through the Word and elaborate on it. Experiences teach us us, the Word. The experiences Nancy and I had on the mission fields, uh, our lives being in danger, and then watching God sweep in and just protect us in unbelievable circumstances and ways, that experience brings me to a greater faith in God. So it's, it's, it's the Word of God, it's dreams, it's visions, and it's experience. God speaks to you every day through the experiences that you have. You can be treated a certain way by customers. You can be treated a certain way by family. And that way they treat you, good or bad, let's say it's bad, it only reinforces your love for them. Because the Scripture says to love your enemies. Go the extra mile. So God is speaking to us through our everyday experiences. Now, the the Pharisees didn't understand that. So now Peter's got a choice to make. Does he take the, I'm really getting on soft ground here. Does he take that experience that he had and throw it over to the side and say, God doesn't speak to me that way? Or does he take that experience and begin to understand what God is saying to him through the experience? So do I simply say, well, God doesn't speak to me that way. How many of us know people today probably uh, in different organizations or groups uh, that they would not receive anything of that nature in their life? God speaks to them through an experience, and their first response would be, God doesn't use experiences anymore. He does use our experiences. And he talks to us all the time through these experiences that we have in our life. Let me give you an example. All right? What made Peter different from the Pharisees? Peter had received the spirit of truth. Now, while he was up there on that rooftop and everything was saying, you don't go by experience. You only go by what the oral law handed down to Moses says. But something must have happened to him that day up there or that night up there because the spirit of truth came to him and spoke to him and basically said, what you're seeing is of God. And God's trying to lead you and guide you and give you a direction of what you're getting ready to do. Peter had no idea that Cornelius had already sent people to his house. And while Peter's up here looking at this sheet of unclean animals, somebody's knocking on his door and saying, hey, we've been sent here by Cornelius to bring you down to the house there and basically open up the entire salvation message to the Gentile people. So what happened to him? There was an experience that began to shape him and shape his understanding of the Word of God. doesn't contradict the Word of God, but it began to help him understand the Word of God. How did it help him understand the Word of God? 
The Word of God says that God has no respect of person. The Word of God says that Jesus, whosoever will call upon the name of Jesus, shall be saved. Now, that's the Word. But in their mindset, had they not received the law of Moses, they could not be saved. There was no hope for them. So God is going to say, I'm going to use an experience, and I'm going to shake Peter up. Because I'm getting ready to let him know the truth of my word. And the truth of my word is this, that everybody is equal. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent from top to bottom, and everybody now has full access unto God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile, irregardless of who you are. So now the spirit of truth comes in through that experience that he had, and now all the Gentiles have access to the power and the salvation message of Jesus Christ. So what really takes place here? That's what made a difference in Peter. He received the spirit of truth. For approximately three and a half years, Jesus had been physically present with the disciples. He was their teacher. He was their counselor. He was their protector. But then he ascended into heaven. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit down. Think about that for a moment. He was with them every single day, Ben. Teaching them, leading them, guiding them, directing them. Because we don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And we think the Holy Spirit is only for the manifestation of the power gifts. No, that is an outcome of who the Holy Spirit is. So if you think about this for a moment, Jesus with the apostles every day, teaching them, leading them, guiding them, showing them the way. I've got to leave you now. I can't be here every day with you. I can't be counseling you every day. I can't be leading you every day. I can't be directing your life every moment of the day. I'm gone. I'm going to sit back down on the, by the right hand of my father and wait till the time is done and I'm going to come back. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll counsel you. He'll show you what the truth is. So basically, when I leave, I'm coming back in a different form for a moment through the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to, through the Holy Spirit, do everything that I did while I was on earth. Now, here's a nugget for you. The only thing he couldn't do now on earth that he could do when he was here is he couldn't heal people. He couldn't touch people. But I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to go with you. And I'm going to be there and do everything I did through the Holy Spirit that I did when I was on earth. But now I'm commissioning you and I am telling you that you now will go forth and you will be my hands and you will be my legs and you'll do it. So Jesus is right here, right now, through the Holy Spirit and through your hands and through your arms, through your legs, through your mouth and through your heart. You're still here. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to do what he had done for the apostles during those years that he was here with them. But he's still here. Marty, he's still here. Oh, girl, if you could open up your spiritual eyes, you'd be sitting right. Well, he won't. You got your purse there. But he'd be one. He'd be one over. There you go. He'd be right there by you. He's there for us. It's amazing. Look at the scriptures now. John 14, 26. He will teach you all things. So the, uh, the Holy Spirit illuminates things in our heart and our spirit. I can listen to a man teach, and, and I can be thoroughly blessed. And I have some individuals that I, I pretty much read everything they've got. And, and I receive an enormous amount. But I've learned a long time ago, I can read something. Have you ever been that kind of a person? That you read something in a book, and you got to go back and read it again? And then you read it again? And you go back, and you hopefully about the tenth time you might get it? <laughs> I've done that a lot of times. First time I mark it in uh, yellow. Then I underline it in a green pencil. 
Uh, then I circle it with a black one. And finally, I'm going to get this thing, all right? But all of a sudden, as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit, I can do something. And, and the Holy Spirit illuminates it immediately. And I know exactly what God is trying to tell me. It's, right, it's just right there. So that becomes what he does. He teaches us all things. John 14, 26, again, another portion of the verse. He will remind you of everything that I have said to you. That's the power of God's Word. He speaks to us through the Word of God. He'll remind you of what He said to you. <clears throat> Didn't I tell you? Didn't I reveal to you? Didn't I show you? Didn't I speak to you? How many of you have been in a process of maybe doing something or saying something, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just jumped right in and reminded you, you don't need to do that and you don't need to say that. He said, I'll remind you of what I've said. I'll remind you of what I've spoken to you in your life. Well, Lord, where do I go from here? I'll remind you. Remember remember that dream I gave you? Remember the word the prophet spoke over you? Do you remember the sermon that you walked out the door and you said, that's it, that's my goal, that's my direction? And you got waylaid and sidetracked? I'll remind you. Hmm, you got quiet on me. Yeah. <laughs> John 15, 26 says, He'll testify about me. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't testify of Himself. He testifies of Christ Jesus. And that's where the Pentecostal church got in a lot of trouble. Okay? Because for many years, the Pentecostal church, we were only about the experience of Pentecost. Okay? That was our focus. Okay? I love, I, you know, you, you listen to preachers sometimes the way they talk. Okay? The Baptists will get them saved. We'll get them speaking in tongues. And the prosperity people will get them rich. Boy, are we messed up. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder the world doesn't want anything we got. That's craziness. But that's mentality sometimes. <clears throat> but we talked only about the Holy Spirit. We, we never talked about the, the office works of the I remember the first time that someone talked to me about the office works of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what they were talking about. Well, he's your paraclete. What do you mean? He's your advocate. He's your lawyer. He intercedes for you. He's at the right hand of the Father. Ever make an intercession for you. The Holy Spirit is there. He's your comforter. Man, you know, when something happens, a tragedy in your life, man can speak words, but only the Holy Spirit can comfort. Man can't really comfort. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So that's all we talked about. The only thing we talked about was the tongues. And the, the criticism was, the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit will testify not of Himself, but of, of, of Christ. And all you talk about is the tongue part. Well, you know what? We deserve the criticism that we got. Because it, it, was, it was out of kilter. So now we go back and we realize that the Holy Spirit is there for us and it counsels us, it leads us, it guides us, it directs us, it shows us things that are yet to come, but it's all to bring honor and glory unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not about me to run around the, pul run around the pulpit and all that. That's okay, that's great, I have no trouble with that. You should have saw me when I was a young teenager on fire. And we had a church flag and... I, I love it and I respected it. But listen, man, when, when the Spirit got moving, I was first one to grab that flag. And, man, I'm getting ready to do Jericho marches all around the church and all around the building on the, on the outside. And, man, I'm going to town with this thing. All right? But it was more than that. And it took me a while to learn that. I'm thankful for what I was taught. But I'm thankful that God spoke more to me. 
John 16, 13, and he will guide you into all truth. Well, how do I know what is right? How do I know what is wrong? Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. And seek the face of God. And be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you what is wrong. You don't need to listen to me. I'm not going to talk myself out of a job here. You don't need me to tell you all the time what's right and what's wrong. Because now you're listening to man. And that's going to get you in trouble. But if the Holy Spirit tells you something, and you've sought God, and God tells you that's not truth, you'll know it in your heart. Do you know why we have so much confusion in the church today? It's because everybody listens to man. We listen to man. We, we look at confusion in the church today, and, and you go like, well, where'd that come from? Well, I heard this preacher tell me this. Well, I, heard, I, I heard this guy uh, preaching about that, and that if we believed this way, we were wrong. Listen, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. I learned a long time ago on the mission fields that, listen... I don't care if you're a Methodist. Uh, I don't care if you're a Presbyterian. I don't care if you're Episcopal. I don't care if you're Baptist, Lutheran. I, it, none of that makes any difference to me. The only thing I care about is do you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus is the only way to heaven. And if you and I can meet at the foot of the cross of Calvary, we can join hands to work together to build the kingdom of God. Amen? That's all that matters. <clears throat> Well, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. Well, then don't speak in tongues. That's up to you. Now, I can't, for me personally, I can't imagine my Christian experience apart from that. Because it's too much a part of who who I am and how I see it in the Word of God. But I'm not going to let that fight get me and you out of heaven. I believe in miracles. Well, how come you believe in miracles? Have you ever seen them? Oh, God, yes. I've seen them by the dozens. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen blind eyes open. We've seen the lame walk. We've seen the deaf hear. We've seen cancers fall off. We've seen goiters just totally disappear as we put hands on and pray. Uh, heart disease and cancer. You name it, we've seen a lot through nothing that we did, but everything that He did. Jesus Christ. Well, I don't believe in miracles. Okay. Then you're just going to have to live a life apart from miracles. But if you believe in Jesus Christ and you believe he died for you on the cross, I'll stroll over heaven with you one day. Okay? Am I being plain enough? That's not an issue of salvation. But I want you to be able to live in the power of the miraculous of God. And I want our young generation, I want them to be able to see the manifestation of the power of God. To know that God is really real. So when a Satanist comes up to them at school and begins to try to convince them of the power of Satan, they can say, yeah, but have you ever seen the blind eye open? Have you ever seen the lame walk, get out of a wheelchair? I have. It happens all the time at my church. That's what I want. For them to be able to see that power. We're going to close this already late. He'll lead you in all the truth. And here's the power. John 16, 13. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He'll tell you what's yet to come. Don't go there. There's tragedy waiting. Don't do this. Or I've got this for you in your life. Now, it's going to happen whether you believe it or not. So don't hinder it. Just let me do what I want to do in your life and watch God bring it to pass. Isn't it powerful to know what is yet to come? See, we all, now again, we're going to talk on prophets and prophecy Sunday. We always want a man to tell us what is yet to come. All right. The world uses astrology 
They use tarot cards. They use mediums. And sometimes if we're not careful, we want the same results through the prophet. Did you hear what I just said? We want the same results through the prophets. We want them to tell us what our future holds. Well, I have respect for the prophets. But I would much rather be in a point of prayer and the Holy Spirit come down and the Holy Spirit begin to tell me what is yet to come in my life. Be ready for whatever he tells you is going to come. Hezekiah prayed for 15 more years. Nobody talks about all the trouble he went through during those next 15 years of his life. <clears throat> we hear God speak to us through experiences. He's always talking to us. Tonight, when you go home, I want you to, in the next day or two, just sit down for a moment. Take a pencil and write down. You know, that you may not remember the date, but I remember when God spoke to me. And I remember what he told me. Because, see, sometimes God has told you that you're literally, now the Word tells you that your family will be saved. But I've known people who have come to me and said the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that my, my husband's going to be saved. Or my wife's going to be saved. I knew a pastor years ago. His wife left him for another man. He remained single. And he said because the Lord told him that the Lord would restore his marriage. He he never married again. He said the Lord told him. Eleven years later. His wife came back to him, and they were remarried. Now, I could say, you sit and wait for 11 years until she gets back. Yeah, right. But if God says it, see, that's the power of hearing the voice of God. If God says it, if God shows you something yet to come, you can go to the bank on that. Because it's God telling you. So put your confidence in God and not man. Man will lead you, but he can only lead you so far. God can take you all the way. So tonight, as we we close, I just want you to realize that the power of the voice of God is so real and so powerful. I was going to share one more part, but I'm afraid if I get into it, we'll be here a little bit longer. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll share a little bit of that Sunday then. Hear the voice of God. Listen to what God is saying. All right? Some of us need to really hit listen to His voice. Now, it took God just basically kind of shutting me down the last couple of days so I could spend a little bit more time with him because I just work as my therapy and I have a project and I'm trying to get it accomplished and done. But the Lord just kind of slowed me down. Now, he's probably been talking to me a lot longer about slowing down, but I didn't listen. David said something very powerful in the 23rd Psalms. And he says that the Lord leads us beside still waters and he causes us to lie down in green pastures. And that's something that restores us. So for some of us that are workaholics, we need to let God lead us beside some still waters and cause us to lie down and have our soul restored. Amen? Now, that's not an easy lesson sometimes to learn. All right. Is this for now, uh, Brandon? Uh, Oh, here they come. All right. Thank you. 
Okay. Carol Allen, we pray for you right now that the affection in your uh, your hand will be healed so it will not require hospitalization. So, Father, we speak to the infection and we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We command it to dry up and be gone from her hand in, name of, in your name, Lord Jesus, right now. Father, I thank you, God, for the power of the cross. I thank you for the power of healing. Thank you for the power of your name. And I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And your Holy Spirit is there with Carol right now. And, Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory for the healing of her physical body in Jesus' name. Lord, for Cheryl that's in the back with our children, a few of her friends or relatives have had COVID. Um, So, Lord, we speak to them that they will be healed uh, and that they'll be totally um, delivered and that this will not um, be any kind of life-threatening situation with them. We give you the praise for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I saw that. All right. Just stretch your hand down. Father, we we come against this COVID. Lord, you have brought us a long way. And, Lord, the protection you've provided for us, God, in this church has been just astronomical. Uh, And I thank you for that. Yeah, we went through some battles with it, but, God, uh, for the best part, we've come out on the other side. Now, I lift up Marty's family and friends, Lord, right now. And, Father, I speak to them in the name of Jesus right now. And I say you are healed in the name of the Lord Jesus right now. Jesus and his healing is your portion. And, Father, I I appropriate that for them in their lives right now. And, Father, Lord, the one that is real serious, Father, even right now as we pray, Father, let the thing be broken up, let it dissipate and be gone from their body. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. How many of you have seen the miracles of where that's happened and God has just really brought them through it? Amen. Father, we just speak a miracle right now for this young boy. Father, I thank you, God, that, Lord, while he was under the water, Lord, you just slowed his system down. And, Father God, that he'll come through this, Lord, and there'll be no brain damage. Lord, there'll be no internal damage, God. Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit, God, to raise him up in Jesus' name. And, Lord, everybody will recognize that it was Jesus who did it. Amen. And he receives the glory. Amen. All right. Well, Sunday morning we're going to talk about prophecy and prophets and and all of that kind of good stuff. And uh, there's things about prophets you don't know. Uh, there's one prophet who uh, uh, would, did something that he wasn't supposed to be doing. He got ate up by lions. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So, anyhow. Uh, but we're going to talk a lot about, because we live in a time when everybody wants to know the answers. We, we have an answer, and that's Jesus Christ. When it comes to prophecy and prophets, always understand what Peter said. We have a more sure word of prophecy, and that's in the Word of God. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Well, we decree, Kemp, Kaufman, Lake Area, the world shall be saved. Amen.